First John chapter number 3, we'll begin reading in verse number 1. The Bible says, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Now, the Apostle John, right in this passage, I mean, we could go all the way back to, you know, John chapter number 3. Okay, John knew a whole lot about the love of God. Okay, I mean, we don't have time to get into, you know, the love of God. That's not what we're teaching on today. We couldn't exhaust that in every Sunday school from now until heaven, and then once we got there, right? The love of God, it's knowable. You can receive it, but it's uncomprehendable. Right? You'll never be able to fully grasp how much God loved you. But then, chapter number 3, verse 1 says, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us. He's not just saying, well, how marvelous is the love of God. He's saying, hey, hang on a second. First word, behold. Take a second. Look at this. He said, love of God, fantastic. He says, but once you kind of, you know, wrap your head around the fact that God does love you, then start thinking about what manner God showed you that love in. He said, it would have been one thing, but Jake, for God to save us and then say, well, you're going to be my slaves. But he didn't do that. They didn't call us servants. Jesus said that the servant doesn't know what the master doeth, but he says he called us friends because everything that God had made known to him, he made known to us. We were not servants. They called us friends. But then one step beyond friend is part of the family. He says, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Not talking about the best of the best. Talking about us. Right? The low down, no good, dirty, rotten sinners. That crowd, God said, no, they're going to be called the children of God. They're going to be made joint heirs with Jesus. When he sees us, he sees him. Right? Think about it this way. The Bible says, I am in him, he is in me. In the eyes of God, Jordan and Jesus are inseparable. Right? They are forevermore the same. Now, I can't wrap my head around that. Right? That the darling Son of God and me would be the same thing. Right? I can't get that. But what manner of love is that? That God would take the worst of the worst, the one that sinned and caused His Son to die upon the tree. I'm the one that killed Christ, but yet now I'm a child of God. He didn't just love us with a little bit of compassion. He didn't save us from hell and say, well, now you're on your own. But he said, no. He'll be one of us. Because if I'm in Christ, the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, that means I'm in the Father too. He didn't just say, you can be a child of God. I'm a part of Him. I mean, think about it. As much as I don't want to admit it, I am a little bit like my father. Right? We all wish that we all would have turned out like my mom, but it didn't happen that way. Yeah, but likewise I'm a part of him well the same is true when it comes to God the father loved us so much not only did he send his son right? for God so loved the world that he sent his son but then what manner of love he showed to us it was an unreserved love he didn't say you, you were responsible for the death of my son so you can't be a part of the family. You've got to be out in the servants' quarters. Right? I'll save you from hell, but you can't spend all of eternity with me. No, he said that we should be called the sons of God. Then, verse number 2, it says, Beloved. Well, after just talking about what manner of God loved us, certainly those that are saved are beloved. 
He says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God. We don't have to wait on it. It's not something that we get inherited into once we pass through the grave. No, now. I don't have to wait on some mountaintop experience to where I finally get to the point that I get my halo down here. No. There's no set of rules that I have to keep for so many years or so many classes or uh, courses that I have to take before God finally says, okay, now you're one of mine. No. At my worst, he said, you want one of mine. The moment that I asked him to save me, I became a son of God. In that instant, however, God does what he does when you get saved in your heart to kill off the old man and to create the new creature. From that moment, I was the son of God. Now are we the sons of God. And, hallelujah, does not yet appear what we shall be. In other words, you know, this is before he got the revelation, but even after he got the revelation, he'd have had a hard time explaining to you what we're going to look like. He did the best he could. You can go over to the book of Revelation and see that he's got, you know, faces brass and eyes of fire, hair white as wool. But that's just what we had that John could well, it kind of looks like wool, but it's whiter than wool. That looks like brass, but brass doesn't do him justice. Right? Fire can't capture what I saw in his eyes. But he had to use words that we understood in order to try and get the point across. So I don't know what we're going to be when he shows up. John got a look at him, but John took that look of him with him to the grave. Nobody else saw the revelation that John did. So guess what? Nobody knows what we're going to look like. It's not going to be them paintings that you see all around the stores around Easter time. Right? It's not going to be some skinny, scrawny little man with his you know, rib cage poking out a little bit of blood dripping down his forehead. No, no, no. He's going to be the King of kings and Lord of lords. But what manner of love that when we do see Him, I don't know what we're going to be. But I know that when we see Him, we're going to be like Him. It says, but we know that when He shall appear, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. In other words, what manner of love? Keep that in mind. That's what He's talking about. What manner of love that not only we'd be a son of God, but He would want us to look like His Son. We know Christ. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. One of these days He's going to sit down on the throne of David in Jerusalem, reign for a thousand years. Then for all of eternity, go read the book of Revelation. Right? Worthy is the Lamb that was slain. Right? Forevermore, Christ is going to be the preeminence of new heaven and new earth and that city of New Jerusalem. Right? We won't have no sun because He's the light of the city. Right? All of creation forevermore, everyone in glory, Jesus is going to be the center point. And He wants us to look like that. See, if it were me, if I wanted Jesus to be the focus, I'd make Him the most beautiful, the most lovely. The centerpiece of it. But yet God, when He looks around at all those that are worshiping His Son, He sees us looking like the Son, worshiping the Son. It just reminds them more of Jesus. We're not going to be a little bit lower. The Bible says that the angels were created a little lower and then, you know, God, but higher than man. Right? They're somewhere in between. We're not in that category. No. We shall be like Him. No half portions, nothing reserved, fully given. Doesn't say that, well, you can kind of look like... He's not going to pull... Well, not pull. He didn't decide to do what He did in the garden. He made man in His image, but man didn't look like God. He wasn't as God. Right? He didn't look like Jesus. Adam didn't. But here we find that because of our Adam, the second Adam, I do get to look like Jesus. That blows my mind. I could talk in circles on how that doesn't make sense to me. But John said, just, just think about how 
one, drink the love of God showed you, but two, the way that God chose to show it to you. He's saying it wasn't parsed out. It wasn't set with conditions. There wasn't criteria that you had to meet in order to merit some of the benefits of being a child of God. No, you just got the whole thing. Whether you realized it when you accepted it or not, God still intended it the same for everybody. We all shall be like Him. Don't know what it's going to be, Brother Ray, but it's going to be great because we're going to look like Him. And you know why that's true? Because if we weren't like Him, if we saw Him, verse number 2, He says, For we shall see Him as He is. In order for us to see Him as He is, we would have had to be like Him. Because if we weren't like Him, we'd have just exploded. He told Moses no man could see Him and live. So imagine standing face to face with God. If you weren't just as He was, you would just fly off into nothing. His glory, His holiness, His righteousness would just consume you. I will remind you, the Bible says, our God is a consuming fire. Anything that isn't holy, He destroys it. It's not a you know, decision. It's just that His glory will destroy anything that isn't holy. Why He said, be ye holy for I am holy. One day we will be. Just like Him. And we'll be able to see Him as He is. Not through the Word, not through faith. Although, hallelujah, we can see Him through faith. But our faith shall be made sight. And I won't have to look. You guys remember the solar eclipse when you had to buy them special glasses so that you could see what was going on or else your eyeballs would have burned out? Because right, you still could have looked at the sun. sun still blind you. But we won't have to have little handout like when you go down Disney, if it's a 3D movie, they're like, here, take your glasses, take your glasses, take your glasses. Not going to be like that when we get to heaven. There's not going to be an angel hand and I got to make sure you put your glasses on before you look at them. Right? It's not going to be one of them. No, we'll be able to see him as he is in his fullness. Okay, but look at verse number three. And every man that hath this hope in him, and we don't have time to teach about that, but our hope isn't in what's preached. Our hope isn't in what man says. The Bible says our hope isn't in in what we were trained up to. Our hope is in the person of Christ Jesus. But we don't have time to get to that. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. Now see that word purify... That doesn't mean to remove your own sin. Okay? We can't do that. He's been made our high priest after the order of Melchizedek. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us. doesn't say that we're supposed to cleanse ourselves, because we can't do that. Okay? It doesn't say that we're supposed to perform that work of that new creature that we talked about. The Bible says that He put a seed in us. What was that? Himself. That's the mystery of God, that He would choose to put Himself into no good, dirty, rotten earthen vessels. But yet He chose to do it anyway. I can't make that grow. I can stand back and let it grow, but He's the one that does that work in us to turn us into that new creature. That's not what this is talking about. It says, Purify Himself, for He, Christ, is pure. So what's he saying? He's saying, those that have the hope that one day we're going to see him, we're going to be just like him, we're going to see him as he is, we're going to receive the full portion that was allotted to us by God as a child of God. Those that have that hope want to be ready to meet him. They purify themselves. In other words, they remove anything that would keep God from doing that in their life. Because one day I'll be just like Him, but in the meantime, I'm not. And when I do see Him, I want to see Him with confidence. Right? That's We're going to get to that here in a minute. I want to meet Him without shame, without reproach. I don't want to you know, have to hide my eyes from Him. I want to be able to look Him square in the face with joy anticipation because I was prepared for him to come before he came 
That was the indictment of the world when Christ came as the Lamb. He told them everything that they needed to know, but nobody was looking for Him. Those that were looking for Him, they weren't even where He was sent to. We know that the wise men, they noticed that something was up. They started consulting the Scripture. The king's born. They knew it. They came looking for Him. They said, where's the king at? We saw a star. Well, first time around, people weren't looking for him. I mean, our pastor preached on it. It was either Sunday or Wednesday, I can't remember now. They're running together in my mind. But that when the Christ return, will he find faith on the earth? Right? Is anybody, anybody going to be holding on to the hope that is in him? The hope that's supposed to be in us? Anybody going to be clinging to it? Because if they are, those that have that hope, that truly believe deep down in their soul, one day they're going to come face to face with an almighty and holy God will purify themselves. Not because they expect anything, not because they want to reward. No, no, no. They purify themselves because they want to be like Him and He is pure. No conditions. No expectations. Not looking to try and upgrade where my mansion is in heaven and get closer to Him. Wherever it is, it's perfect. Because He made it for me. Let's be honest. He made a place for us because He's a great host and He does all things well. How often do you really think you're going to use that mansion? We're going to be worshiping Him for all of eternity. How do you plan to do that if you're inside sleeping? You'll have no need of sleep. I don't find that after the marriage supper that there's ever a meal in heaven. Must be one really good meal. What are you saying? All the things that people get wrapped up in and concerned about, not important. When we get there, it's all about Him. One day we might be able to have a little, you know, social hour. Hey, John the Baptist. But let's be honest, you're not going to care who's there. All that matters is that he's there. I don't make myself pure because one day I'm going to get to see my grandma, Aunt Lynn. I make myself pure because he's pure. I don't make myself pure because one of these days I'm going to get to meet those that were the forerunners of the faith for me that prayed somebody else into the family. That shared the gospel with somebody in my family that led them to my goodly heritage. I'm not really going to care about that. Why? Because it's all about Him. So then the indictment is, while we're here, why isn't everything about Him? That's what these verses are saying. It says, Behold what manner of love the Father has stowed upon us, that you can be just like Him. You know why He wants you to be just like Him? Because unless they see Christ, we can't help anybody. If it's about me, nobody getting help. So the Father made me like Him so that the world could see me, but really see Him. Behold what manner of love God showed upon us, bestowed upon us, that means gave to you on purpose. means what an accident. Okay, that not only we should be the sons of God, but also that we should be just like Him. No difference. Why? Because it's all about Christ. You go and study out the epistles that the Apostle Paul wrote. You're going to find that the reason we look like Him is so that Christ gets the glory. If I still look like me, it's not about Christ. In fact, the only thing that was predestinated was that those that did get saved would be conformed to the image of Christ. Because if I was enough, Christ wouldn't have had to come. So i got to lose me and get more like Him. Everything in salvation, everything about the faith, truly, is about just letting Jesus shine. Because it's all about Him. He said that if we lift Him up, He'd draw all men unto Him. 
Nowhere in there does it say that we're supposed to lift Brother Brian up on a stick and say, hey, come get some help. They're going to see Brother Brian and say, we don't want to come get that help. Right? We don't want that. So if everything about the future is about Christ, if everything about the faith revolves around Christ, why wouldn't everything now revolve around Christ in your life? So with the Lord's help this morning, we're going to teach on purifying yourself. Purifying yourself. We see the motivation to purify ourselves in verse number 3. We've already read it. Even as He is pure. He loved me so much to lay down His life for me. And He said that He came to give His life and life more abundantly. He said that if we take His yoke upon us, His yoke is easy and His burden is light. He promised that He'd never leave us nor forsake us. He promised to go step by step with us from here until glory through the person of the Holy Ghost. Which we're going to get to that here in a second too. But our desires should be... Well, let's, let's break it down. If you all remember... When you got saved, if you like me, you was under conviction for a while. It wasn't one of them where you was just under conviction and then all of a sudden you just decided to get saved. Right? No, we're just, again, I said, I'm like my dad. I'm hard-headed, stubborn. Okay? That was a joke. Y'all can laugh at that. The pastor's stubborn and hard-headed. Okay? It took me a while to give in. But when I did, what I was saying is, Lord, I'm not good enough. I need you. And what did he do? He sealed you with the Holy Ghost. He gave him, or gave you himself. So when we got saved, we had to say, I'm not enough. I need to be like you. I need Jesus because Jordan wasn't enough. So in that moment, what we're saying is, Lord, you loved me, sent your son. Your son died for me, was buried. Three days later, rose again. Now he's ascended in glory forevermore, seated at the right hand of the Father. He drew me to Himself with cords of loving kindness. He was long-suffering, right? merciful, gracious. And little by little, the Holy Ghost working on me, working on me, until I eventually say, Lord, I'm not enough. I need Jesus. In that moment, you were saying, Jesus is what I need. That's what God will accept. Nothing else. So I need Christ. So when you got saved, whether you said that, or whether it was implied. I can tell you what I prayed when I got saved. Lord, please save me, please save me, please save me. But I can take you to... It was on a concrete step in our garage because Dad's getting ready to go out of town on a... I can't remember if it was a camp meeting or what it was. But yeah. It was after church one night. Couldn't go to sleep. Every time I was closing my eyes, all I could think about, all I could see was the flames of hell. I know where I was. I know what I said. But really what I was saying is, I need Him, because He's all that God will accept. So if that's how you got in, how do you think you're supposed to live day by day? I need Him, because that's all that God will accept. What you said when you got saved was, Lord, make me pure like Christ is pure. Because that's all that He will accept. There was one sacrifice made, for all man's sin and that's the only sacrifice God would accept well why was the sacrifice accepted because it was the darling beloved holy son of God if that was the sacrifice that was accepted it wasn't because of how it, there's a whole bunch of people been crucified throughout history been a whole lot of people that have been buried in fact a few of them Jesus told them to get up out of the grave it wasn't that act that caused us to get saved. It was that Christ did it to every jot and tittle of what the Word of God said He would do. He fulfilled what God said was the standard. He showed that He was pure. So that I would have the faith that He was what I needed. He didn't live 33 and a half years of sinless perfection for His own glory. He had all glory. Still has all glory, has all power. 
But He had it all. He did it for our benefit. That we'd be able to look at the Scriptures and believe that He was who He said He was. God could have said, believe in the name of my Son, and that would have been it. God said it. That settles it. But God did it all to help our unbelief because He gave every man a measure of faith. So He did it to help the unbelief. But with that little bit of faith, after we get saved, because He is pure, every time I get in here, all I find is how great, how marvelous, how wonderful He really is. Right? Except now I can look at it and instead of seeing how no good, dirty, rotten I was, now I just find more and more things that originally I didn't know were in there. I mean, it's one thing to hear that He promised He'd never leave you nor forsake you when somebody's just preaching it or somebody's just teaching on it. Or you were in Sunday school and they had you learn the verse little by little every week until eventually you get the whole... That's fine in that. But until it really sets into it that God wrote that for you? That's a whole new experience. I mean, really wrap your head around the fact that the psalmist wrote daily he loaded us with benefits. That can't. Because my pea brain can't wrap my head around all the benefits that he really gives us every day. And even if I abuse it or neglect it or fail to use it today, He's still going to give it to me tomorrow because He's God. I can't wrap my head around that. Part of me in the flesh that, well, if somebody doesn't use it, somebody does it wrong, don't let them do it again. Don't give them enough rope to hang themselves. Right, take it back. God's not that way. He's long-suffering, merciful, and gracious like we've already talked about. He is altogether lovely. Yet He chose to love us. So knowing that, every time I get in here, Lord, I know that I'm not what You want me to be. Why? Because I know that when we see Him, we're going to be like Him. But until then, I'm not. Until I see Him, the work isn't finished yet. So I desire to be more pure today than I was yesterday. Well, how do I do that? I remove those things, as we've already talked about, in my life that prevent God from completing that work of the new creature in me. The only thing on earth that can limit God is man's will. It's not man's power. It's not man's intellect. It's not man's desires. God can do what He wants to do, but He chose to make man a free moral agent, and He won't unless we let Him. So in our lives, to purify ourselves is to remove that part of me that says, I don't want to. That's a, I don't know why I just saw this. Back when I was decently in shape and playing football, which has it's been over a decade now. So if you're wondering what happened, a lot of meals between then and now. And a lot of snacks too. And lots of Pop-Tarts. But... There was always a part of me when we was lifting weights. When we was really lifting weights didn't bother me. I was okay with lifting weights. I was okay going out and hitting each other. It was the running. I hated running. Despised it. Absolutely hated it. And I even got it easy because I was a lineman. I got to run with the fat guys. Half the time I got to take it easy. All I had to do was finish in front of them and I didn't get yelled at. Because some of them was big boys. But there was something, every time I'm running, there was that part of me that says, why in the world are we doing this? Right? We already ran 10 sprints. Why do we need to do 11? 10's a nice round number. Who came up with 11? Right? There's always that part of me that, I'm in better shape than that guy. Why didn't he have to run more than I do? Right? Let me stop. I've proved I'm in shape. But, and I hated the bleachers, running the bleachers. And if they thought it was too easy, they'd start handing you dumb, or the big round plates for the weights on the bench press. Ah, it's too easy for you. Pick that weight up. Hated it. In the back of my head the whole time, why we drop this weight and go home? There's air conditioning at home. There's only 12 steps at home, not 400. We can get up 12 steps. 
Right? Well, Christianity, is, the flesh is always in the back of your mind saying, well, here's all the reasons we don't want to give in to what God wants us to be. Purifying ourselves is just biting down and understanding maybe hard now, but in November it's going to be worth it. When the other guy on the other side of the field sucking wind, right, and he's about ready to have a heart attack, we're going to be okay. We're going to be tired, but we're not going to be dead tired. Right? When it comes time to your hike, it's going to be hot. And we're going to have pads on them. We're not running with pads on right now. We're on the track. So we got to get in shape now so that when we put the pads on, we're not going to pass out. Purifying ourselves is removing those things that are inhibiting God doing what He wants to do in our life. I can't cleanse myself from sin, but I do have enough sense that if I ask God, and I cry out, Lord, help remove these things that are part of that old man. I know I can't do much, but I do know when I'm in the will of God and when I'm not in the will of God. I do know what will keep me in the will of God and what will pull me out of the will of God. So Lord, help me, purify me, so that I can be like you. See, God's not going to come down and swat them bad thoughts away in your head. Right? He said that He made His kings and priests, kings to rule and reign over this flesh. He said, I've given you everything you need to deny the flesh and embrace Christ. All you got to do is just do it. But, well, what's the secret? Just do it. Well, it may be hard. Yeah, but the decision is either do or don't do. You've got to make that decision for yourself. But someone that has that hope, that promise, they're convinced in their mind, one day I'm going to stand before a thrice holy God and give an account of what I've done for them. They're going to say, I strive to be pure because He is pure. And I want to be pleasing unto the Father. Okay, look with me if you will. Verse number 19. Talking about being pure before God. It says, And hereby we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before Him. Or in other words, we know in our hearts that when we stand before God, not only did we have the truth, but we were of the truth. That's what it says, that we are of the truth. Lord, not only did you save me, but I did my best to let Christ live in me, and I became a part of the truth, that if you give your life to Jesus, He'll make it into something that you never could. I was a part of the truth that those that seek Him do find Him. And those that find Him, He does something marvelous with them. Because we're just a bunch of dirt. But He can make us into vessels of honor for His glory. But this is how we can assure our hearts before Him. In other words, when we stand before Him, this will be our defense to where we can say, Lord, I did what you wanted me to do. Verse number 20. For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then we have confidence towards God. He says, here's the benchmark. We've already seen the motivation on how to purify ourselves. Here's the mechanism on how to purify ourselves. He's our motivation. But how do we know if we're living up to the standard? There's this thing, for me, it's right about here. And when I get under conviction real good, that feels like somebody's just got a knot right there in the middle of my chest. You know what that is? That's God getting a hold of my heart. He says, for if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. In other words, he's saying, you don't even know half the things that you do most of the time. We're not, we don't even give a second thought to the things that we say after we say them. Later on that day, if somebody were asked, hey, what did you say to that person in that conversation? I can give you a recap, but if you want a word-by-word -word replay, I can't give that to you. Well, guess what? God does have a word-by-word -word replay. So if we sit down before the Word of God and we're desiring more of Him, you really don't even need to ask Him what you need to 
improve on what you need to address because the more you find out about him the more you realize you aren't like him if you desire to get close to him when you get in the scriptures he's going to show you those things that keep you from getting closer to him why? because if I desire to get closer I've got to be less like me I've got to purify myself I have to use my will and say Lord I'm moving this out of the way to show that I do desire you more than I desire this or I desire these things in my life I'm removing if you remember the illustration of the silversmith that God uses in the Bible he takes the dross off the top what's that? those are the impurities the things that aren't silver they have no value in fact they pollute the rest of the silver and make it less valuable but it's a whole lot better in your life if you say Lord I'm taking these impurities and I'm putting them over here I don't know all of my faults Lord but you've showed me this one I want to get, get it right I want to get it out of my life it may not be sin it may be iniquity that's unequal dealing with God you may not have been given God what God truly deserves in your life. It may not be sin or iniquity. It may just be a lukewarmness. You're neither in nor out. Lord, here's my indecisiveness. Lord, here's my complacency. Here's my apathy. Remove those things from our life. Purify ourselves. And then you don't have to go through the fire for God to remove it from you. If we choose to set it aside, we may save ourselves a little bit of time, a little bit of heat, a little bit of suffering. Well, why are we suffering? Because I won't let go of the thing that God wants me to let go of. He's doing it for my good because He knows I don't need it. But if we choose to give it up, that's the sign of someone that desires to be like Him. Because God doesn't have to pry it from them because He won't take it unless they give it. Sometimes, some of us have to get real miserable before we let God have what He desires. The better alternative is, Lord, I'm going to set it aside because I know you're not happy with it and I want to get closer to you. But then it says, for if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart. I don't even know all the stuff that I do. So if my heart if I get under conviction about the things that I do know, God knows everything. Even those things deep down in my heart that I can't even know. All the things that this tongue's capable of saying that could, you know, kill the spirit of revival, could kill my own spirituality, could make a mockery of anything that I would ever do for God. I don't know what those things are. Don't want to find out. But God knows them. So if my heart condemns me, certainly. How much more so when I stand before God all the things that I'll be ashamed of. But then he says in verse number 21, Hallelujah, Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then have we confidence towards God. Because here's the thing. Some things are out of my control. Outside the grace of God, I don't know what I would be. But hallelujah for the grace of God. What he's saying is, no man's going to be perfect because we're still in this sin-cursed flesh. Your heart's going to be wicked till your heart goes back to the dirt. Right? This mind that God gave us, we can use it for His honor and His glory, but it's still sin curse. It's going to go back to the dirt. As the songwriter wrote, when this poor lispering and stammering tongue be silent in the grave. It's going back to the grave. I won't have to deal with it anymore. And all the times that I want to say that, I've gotten, a little, gotten better. Don't say them no more. But I still think them. Still want to say them. Right? But all them times that I've wrestled, won't have to wrestle with it no more. Because I'll be like him, because I'll see him as he is. But until then, if I can get in the Word of God and see Christ and my heart doesn't condemn me, which that's a big if. Because every time I get in here, I find something. It's not that I find it, he reveals what's in the way. I could be nitpicky about everybody else. I got too, too much trouble taking care of the things that he shows me about me. Don't have time to worry about you. But if you desire to be pure when he reveals it, you'll set it aside. 
And if you can get into the Word of God, if you can ask God, Lord, is there anything that you're unhappy with? And if you don't fall under conviction, you can have confidence that you're where you need to be with God. Are you perfect? No. But one day you will be. But you've done all that you can. I wonder how many people could say that. The Apostle Paul said that he had to die daily, that he was chiefest of sinners. Could I'm not going to ask anybody to, but could anybody in here raise their hand and say, I have confidence towards God that I'm exactly where I need to be. Nothing added, nothing removed. Because if we hit that point, we can stand before Him and we'll hear, well done. We won't have to be ashamed. Lord, it wasn't always perfect, but I did try my best because I loved you and I wanted to be pure as you were pure. When you did show me that I did wrong, I got it under the blood. And you know what that means? It's gone. He remembers it no more. Right? Not like he wrote it down and erased it. No, no, no. Never existed in the eyes of God. That's how you can have confidence towards God. That's the mechanism of how we can purify ourselves. But then, look at with me in verse number 24. And he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him. It's a whole other lesson on dwelling in him. And he in him. And hereby we know that he abideth in us by the Spirit which he hath given us. Right, we've already talked about the motivation. We've already talked about the mechanism. But here's the real movement of purifying ourselves. As we've already said, God may reveal to us that He wants us to remove something from our life. Certainly, God can take it from you. But He's not a taskmaster. He loves you. He's your Father. You're a child of the King. He asked for it. And as a sign of faith, if we give that impurity that He wants us to let go of, then He rewards it with something better. Himself. More of himself. Knowledge of himself. A deeper and richer fellowship with himself. But who's doing all the moving and shaking? The Holy Ghost. Right? Who shows us that we either don't have confidence with God and that we're condemned, or who shows us that we are where God wants us to be? The Holy Ghost. God himself. John says... Verse number 3, And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself. But really what John's saying is, if you really desire, and you have the hope that one day you're going to be like him, you want to meet him on the best terms that you can, and you're just overjoyed at how much God loves you, he says you're going to purify yourself. But he says, but God knew that you didn't even have enough common sense to know what to purify in your own life. So he gave us himself. We desire to be like Him, but yet He's already in us, and I'm already in Him. You see, when He says, the Spirit which He hath given us, didn't say that the Spirit which we had, you know, received, or that was, you know, poured out onto the earth. Holy Ghost always been, in the beginning, Spirit, capital S, Moved on the face of the waters. Holy Ghost always been here on earth. Long before I ever showed up. Didn't need me. Didn't have to do anything with me. Didn't have to convict me. He was always here, but then one day, on the day of Pentecost, God poured out the Spirit and made known the Spirit of God. Because you can go back when Jesus was baptized, the Spirit was there. Lighted on Him like a dove. Always here, but man had no knowledge of the Spirit until the day of Pentecost when God said, Okay, Holy Ghost, move on in. And those that were saved received Him. He gave Him. The reason the Spirit was on the waters in the beginning was so that when you got saved, the Spirit was already here waiting on you to move in. He gave Him, and to show how serious He was, the Spirit said, I'll go down before he ever said, let there be light, spirit moving on the face of the waters. 
Spirit moving in heaven. Spirit already on earth, waiting on us. Because Jesus was the Lamb slain before the foundation of the world, so when the world was founded, the Holy Ghost said, I'll just go wait on them. He says, I'll be there, ready. And He gave Himself, not just through His Son, but also through His Spirit, so that you would have the guide, because the Spirit would lead, us, lead and guide us into all truth, of what we should be and what we shouldn't be. What we need to address right now. What we need to say right now. Where we need to go right now. It's all about Him. So how would we know what He wants unless He told us? And I don't have to consult the Scriptures every second of every day to figure out what God wants. One, that word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. But two, the things that I put in me, the Holy Ghost is really good at bringing them back to my remembrance when I need them. That feeling that something isn't right here. Maybe I need to pull off at this exit on the interstate. Next thing you know, huge wreck up the road. Could have been in it. You know what? This is something about that guy is not right. I'm thankful that His Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the sons of God. His Spirit bears witness with our spirit on a whole lot more than that. Pray without ceasing. If the lines of communication are always open, He's going to do some talking. Not with an audible voice, but in that still small voice down in here. Purity is not just removing those things that are in the way between me and Him. It's listening to that voice and living the way that we should, living as Christ. Those people down in Antioch, they got that. They understood that. Why? Because they were called Christians because they lived like Christ. Purity, it, I can't give you a standard of, well, if you stop doing all these things, you can stand before God with confidence. You will have thoroughly purified yourself. I can't say that. You know who can tell you that? Holy Ghost. You know who can lead you into all truth, but also along the way, the Word spiritually discerned. The Word wouldn't even be a lamp under your feet and a light near your path unless the Holy Ghost told you what the Word was really saying. Taught it to you the way that you needed it to be taught. He's doing all the moving. All the shaking, all we got to do is listen. I have to choose to do what the Holy Ghost reveals unto me. But if I have that desire, then I want to be like Him. Because I know that He's the only thing that God accepts, and I want to be acceptable unto my Heavenly Father. Behold, what manner of love that not only He gave His Son, but He gave part of Himself to put in me. That no matter how awful, how wicked or rebellious or sinful I get, He promised that He'd keep me sealed until the day of redemption. He'd never let him go. It's one thing to understand how great God's love is. another thing to realize how good God gave His love to you. And that should make us desire to be more like Him. should give us that desire to where we would be pure in His eyes because we want to be pleasing unto our Heavenly Father. Thanks to listeners like you, IBC has had over 100,000 views on our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.